Yeah, today uh, I'll present to you what to do with your data in a serverless world. And I admit it's a very big title. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about all the aspects when it comes to data as much as I would like to. They only gave me 30 minutes, so we'll just focus on uh, data storage today. But uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Angela Timofte. I work as a tech lead at Trustpad, and I've been with the company for five years. And sorry if I'm in the picture, if you guys try to make uh, take pictures, and I'm pretty sure, so you'll see the, the slides. But if, if I'm in the way, just make sign, like move, move, and I'll do it, I promise. Uh, all right, but let's look at the agenda for today. So. First, I want to talk about uh, Trustpilot. I hope everyone heard about Trustpilot. Yes, yeah. Uh, if not, I'll just uh, give you a few details about who we are and what we do. Then we will uh, jump and talk about service architecture at Trustpilot, what we do to um, have a serverless infrastructure followed by the AWS uh, offers when it comes to data storage. And then we will try at least to answer a burning question on how to choose the right uh, data store. And in the end, it comes the, the fun part. Let's try and model some uh, real applications and see how uh, we do that at Trustpilot. And I'll finish up with some lessons that we learned and I want to share with you. So, <laughs> Trustpilot. Uh, I took a screenshot of our homepage in case you guys haven't uh, seen it before. But what we do is uh, collect reviews about uh, companies. And um, for instance, if you are in the situation where you don't know if you should uh, purchase from a specific company, Trustpilot is the, it's a good place to go and verify. And the same if you have an experience that you want to share with uh, the world, just go on Trustpilot. And also, if you own a company uh, and you want to see what your customers think about you, just go on Trustpilot and try and engage with your customers. So that's what we do. Um, the company was founded in 2007 in Denmark and it grew quickly to now we have seven global offices and more than 700 uh, employees. So we're quite big. We, we can't say that we're a startup anymore, but we're really keen on saying that still, even though it's like 700 people, come on people, like move on, you're not a startup. But we're like, no, in our hearts, we're still a startup. Um, but to understand more about the, the challenges that we have at Trustpilot, I uh, have more numbers to share with you. I also like numbers, so you'll see a bunch of numbers in this presentation. But yeah, we have 50 million uh, users at the moment, like more actually than 50 million, and then more than 70 million uh, reviews, so quite a lot of data. And then in terms of scaling, I actually checked the number of reviews that we've got last month, and was 1.8 million reviews compared to two years ago when we had 900,000 reviews. So we doubled our numbers in two years. And I also put a graph there where you can see from the beginning of the company up to now how the number of reviews and the number of companies, it just went up. And it's great from a business perspective. I mean, we want that, of course. But from a technology perspective, it comes with challenges because we have to build services that can handle all this scale. And for that reason, at Trustpilot, we, every time when we develop a new service, we want to, to create something that can uh, scale with the business because we don't want to be in a situation where we say, oh, we don't want more people to come and visit Trustpilot, just stop people because our services are going down and I have to be up all night to scale this stuff. Uh, so, with that in mind, it's very important at Trustpilot to build serverless applications because they can scale with what you do. And what we, we've done to actually encourage that uh, serverless mindset in the, in the company was to create um, 
an engineering principle that everyone in the organization needs to follow. And I'll share with you what it says. I'll have to read this out because I haven't memorized it. Please don't tell my manager about this, but I'll have to read it out. So this, um, there we go. Serverless first. If serverless is not uh, available or practical, containers are recommended. Virtual servers, EC2, are considered legacy and should be avoided. We do this because we strongly believe that serverless is the future of the cloud and would like to be on the forefront of that movement. Serverless might not necessarily be the right choice for everything today, but start your architecture discussions there. We're in the process of fading out virtual servers and want to avoid creating new ones. The benefits of serverless and containers over virtual servers are, di are diverse. Cost savings, better scaling, better orchestration, reduction of operational cost, and modernizing our cloud stack. And what I like about the way this, um, this principle was created is the fact that it's not forcing the engineers to go just for serverless. It just gives you the option. It tells you, like, just start the discussion there. You don't have to go serverless necessarily, but start with that first. Like, and then you'll see. If it's not the best uh, option, OK, fine. We'll figure out later, but just start the discussion. And that actually was very helpful for us because by some people weren't that happy about this, this movement in the beginning. I should say they were early adopters for, uh, for serverless and Lambda functions back in 2014 when it was launched, like we already started. So people weren't that impressed in the beginning. So we had to do something about that. And saying like, OK, just start there. Fine if you don't want to uh, use serverless, but start there. And then the other uh, thing that I like about the way the, the principle was um, created is that it gives you the reason why the company wants to move uh, in this direction. It tells you like it's uh, good for cost, it, it scales, so things that are important for us, and that's the whole reason why we insist. It's not just us wanting this, right? And I have a graph here which shows um, since we we introduced this uh, principle, uh, the line, I don't know if it's visible, but the blue line is for uh, EC2 um, instances, the red one for uh, containers, yellow or orange, I don't know what that color that is, is for lambda function, and then the green is for S3. And you can see that we've been doing pretty well in removing the EC2 instances since we introduced the, the principle and the number of containers and the Lambda function just went uh, up. I'm very uh, happy to see that Lambda now it's actually overtaking containers because I think we've been quite comfortable to just go for containers. So it's nice to see that line going uh, up. But this is just about compute and that's the thing. Oh. I'm breathing in the mic, sorry. Um, I have to breathe as well. <laughs> um, that's the thing when you talk about serverless. Everyone is talking about compute, lambda functions, and like how do we get rid of uh, EC2 instances and so on. But serverless is not just that. And that takes me to the next slide. And as I mentioned, service is not just function as a service. So I think it's important to mention that, for instance, AWS is offering uh, serverless tools when it comes to storage, to data stores, to analytics. And as I mentioned in the <coughs> beginning, we're not going to look at all, all of this, but today we'll focus on the data stores. And we'll go into more details on what they what they do and how you can use it. But just so you know, there are options there when it comes to serverless, so go and check it out. But now let's start with Amazon DynamoDB. And DynamoDB, it's a NoSQL uh, database. It is a document or key value store. And actually, 
the way I, I want I like to define DynamoDB is that it's a key value store on steroids <laughs> because you can do more than just key value. You can add the sort keys and you have streams. So it is it, 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 you can't say it's just a key value store, so that's why yeah, it's uh, called also a document. You can use it as a document store as well, but yeah, I still like the, the other way of key value store on, on steroids. And then DynamoDB, the thing that it's really uh, great as is that it can scale to any workload. So it doesn't really matter um, if you have a small amount of data that you want to store or very large or if you put a lot of workload on your uh, um, table or not so much because that's the beauty of serverless uh, databases it, uh, it's that it will scale with what you what you do and you also pay for how much you use so it's very nice it doesn't matter anymore like if if uh, you use this table a lot or not or how what's the size and so on and so forth because you will you will just at the end of the day you will pay what uh, you use um, and then it's worth mentioning that it's very fast and consistent but it's fast when you use it right. <laughs> and I think it's the case for any NoSQL database that when you create your table, you need to make sure that the way you store your data it will answer the questions that you have. So don't go and scan the whole table and be like, oh, but DynamoDB is not fast. And you said it was fast. Well, don't scan it. Query and <laughs> store your data correctly. And I'm, I'm actually going to show you some um, uh, some graphs from uh, from what we we've been doing at Trustpilot when uh, we didn't really follow what I just said, um, but yes, you have to know it's very fast as long as you use it correctly. Uh, then with DynamoDB you have access control, so you can um, define who has access to your to your data. You can create your own uh, role and say like, okay, these services can actually write and read from my uh, data. So you have full control on defining that. And then it's really, um, uh, DynamoDB, it's really nice at um, using with event-driven um, programming. And Later, when I have the modeling real, uh, real application, you'll see exactly that, how I use that. And since I mentioned that at Trustpile, we've also been doing not so smart things. Um, and I think it's um, the main reason was that before we went for DynamoDB, we also started, we also uh, starting using DynamoDB at the beginning when we had absolutely no knowledge and we jumped from using um, Mongo database to DynamoDB and then we're trying to do the same thing in DynamoDB as in Mongo and it didn't work. And we had things like this, uh, just spikes and we the, the table didn't have time to actually react to what we're doing and then we're not really using the whole idea with serverless databases where it can actually scale with your uh, with your workload. As you can see, it was just like 170. Like that's that's not good, but it was all on us. It's not the, the table. It was how we were pushing data. And then the other day, this is actually new. <laughs> like you can see, it's on 23rd was yesterday when I saw this. Um, so. In for a DynamoDB, you can define the auto scale that uh, you want. So you can say, okay, this uh, table can scale between one and four hundred or four thousand or whatever. You scale the, you, you set the auto scale group. And in this case, you can see that the blue line is the consumed, and the red is the provisioned. So that means all those reads are throttled, so we don't get that data, and that's because when we set the auto scale, we said, oh, it can't go above 250, which it might be the case, like in case you don't want to pay a lot for these tables and it's something that is not important and you're like, okay, if it goes above this, I don't care, it's fine, I'm losing data. 
but just take that in consideration. In this case, it was actually an important table, and I go and I have to go and uh, talk to the team that has this one because I don't know how they missed it. But it happens. Um, and then uh, here, for instance, we have a very busy table, and at some point we had the spike when it when it went to fifteen thousand. Um, is it read capacity? Yes. So very, very busy. But you can see how, how nicely the, um, the provision goes up and down based on, your, um, on what you're using. So it's very nice. Imagine if you had an old type of, uh, of database where you had to take a specific uh, instance. And then when you have a specific instance type, then you have to take it for your uh, uh, spikes, right? So then I'll probably, if it's normal to have that huge spike there, I'll have to take a huge instance that can work when I have these kind of spikes, which is not great, right? Because then I'll pay for much more than I actually need. And imagine, for instance, uh, Black Friday for us at Trustpilot a couple of years ago when we weren't doing serverless. Whew, Black Friday wasn't a good day for us. <laughs> we we're definitely not going out to shop. We we're at work and we're like, okay, let's double all the instances, everything, just to be sure. And then we'll see how much we actually use. But we were paying for all those uh, all things that we weren't using. But now with this, we don't care. It's like, it's going to do their job. It's fine. It will scale up and down. And I can go and shop finally. On Black Friday, yeah, a true story. I actually went shopping a couple of years ago for Black Friday. I was out, and then uh, one of my colleagues called me, and he was like, oh, "You have to come back." And I'm like, well, "I'm shopping. Come on." I went back. Yes, no shopping for me. My boyfriend was happy about that, probably, but <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. Uh, and then something else that I've seen, it w wasn't that great. Um, and this is actually a staging table, which when we defined the uh, provisioning, we set it for 100 write capacity. And you can see it, nothing is happening on this table, so why are we paying? I mean, yes, DynamoDB Dynamo is very cheap. You have to know that it's very cheap, but still, it's some money. Like, Don't just waste money. So yeah, you have to to know these things and make sure you have uh, metrics that are uh, pushing this kind of data that you don't, at the end of the month, will be surprised why you pay this or that. But now let's move to the next uh, serverless uh, data store, and that's Amazon Aurora Serverless. And Aurora Serverless, it's a fully managed MySQL and Postgres uh, uh, data database. And they actually just, I think was this summer, they introduced the Postgres, which I know they may, it made many people very happy about. So when I was actually preparing a while ago about um, for uh, a similar talk about data, databases, I was like, oh, that's a limitation for Aurora Serverless. It's only compatible for MySQL, but it's not the case, so I can't complain about that anymore. Um, but Aurora Serverless, it's a relational uh, data store. And as you can see, Amazon is trying to cater for both sides, for SQL and NoSQL people. So no fight there. You, you have an option for uh, whatever uh, um, use case you have. Uh, similar to DynamoDB, it scales compute and uh, memory. And with Aurora Serverless, you only have access within VPC, which some see that as a limitation. And since I'm talking about limitation, I want to go further and I have to mention Aura Serverless, it's quite new, so of course they are missing some, some things out there. And since we have some people from AWS, I have to mention this, so maybe they change it. You guys, look, look, I'm complaining about this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let, let's just look at what it is. Um, 
it's compatible only with um, MySQL 5.6 version and Postgres 10.7. Uh, uh, so just have that in mind. Also, it can't load data from Amazon S3 bucket, and that's that's the hardest for me personally. So that's why it's there. I don't know if anyone else cares about it, but I do. So it's there. Uh, and also, it can invoke uh, AWS uh, Lambda functions, and that's the beauty with DynamoDB that you can create the flow with Dynamo triggering Lambda functions directly. And I have an example with just that, so we'll look at that uh, later. And then, for instance, if you have sustained workloads, then the prices pricing for Aurora Surface uh, becomes a bit more expensive compared to the server side Aurora. And here, yeah, for instance, if you know your uh, your workload on your data, it's always flat. It it's always the same, then you can go and say, okay, I need this type of instance and I'm done. I don't need you to go and uh, scale for me. I know this is my workload. But I would say it's rarely the, the case uh, to to be that, that sure about your workload and it's definitely not not our case. So if, if you know your data goes up and down and um, the way you use it, it's up and down, or a serverless, it's still much cheaper than buying a specific instance type. But now let's jump to the burning question, which I know many people have, at least I always have this. Uh, how to choose the right database? And the way I do it and the way we do it at Trustpilot, we try to follow a few criteria. And I think it's always important to start with the purpose. What are you trying to do with your data? And then see, like, are there databases that were created to solve exactly this? And then it's a good place to start. Then look at the size uh, of your data. Is it the bounded or unbounded uh, data that you're trying to store? And that's also something that you should consider. Then compute. What are you trying to do with this data? Are you doing like crazy computation functions or not? And that's again gonna uh, give you an indication of what you can use. Also, if latency is very important, for instance, if millisecond is not good enough and you need microseconds, like that's also gonna push you in a certain direction in terms of uh, data. And the the last criteria that I like to to mention that. So many people are mentioning this, but I think in the real world, it's very important. And that's the price. You have to look at the price of, uh, of how much you uh, spend in storing this, this uh, data, and that's, again, going to help you. And if on top of this, now we put the serverless first approach when it comes to data stores as well, just as the principal was saying, start the discussions with serverless in mind. So in in our case, when I know I have, okay, I need to store some new data, what should I do? Then I start, okay, from these serverless uh, options that I have here, like, can they ca cater for my purpose? Is it good for the size? Compute, do I need the, the relational this store or not? And uh, then usually the price part uh, the serverless stores are always winning. So just start the discussion with the serverless data stores first and then see if you can adjust it. It might not be the case for everything and you have to keep that in mind. Don't, don't push it and try to reinvent the wheel. Like if you find a database that was created specifically for what you're trying to do, go with that. But just start discussion with the serverless approach first. Yes, so what we use at Trustpilot, as you can see, DynamoDB is winning the race. We have 109 production tables. Uh, then we have 14 uh, clusters in Aurora. And I have to, to be honest, all, I believe only four of them are serverless. And it is 
mainly because of some of the limitations that Aurora Serverless has at the moment, but uh, we're always trying to keep an eye and see when AWS it's, uh, it's going to change some some of uh, of those things. I'm definitely watching every day. Like, did they did that thing? No, no, not yet. Okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, watching you guys. Um, and then, yeah, we still have some data in MongoDB, and we consider MongoDB as a legacy, so we want to move all that data from from there, but. We we didn't find the right uh, solution right now. Uh, we're looking at uh, document databases, but we're still uh, uh, discussing that. And then, as you can see, we have a bit of uh, everything else because purpose, as I mentioned, it's very important. So we need, uh, for instance, oh, I, yeah, Redis, Elastic Cache, it's not there. We use Elastic Cache as well because uh, uh, latency was very important in that use case, and we needed the microsecond uh, um, ability to get data. So, yeah, as I mentioned, purpose is very important. But as you can see, like we can cater with DynamoDB majority of our use cases. <laughs> and I have to say, in the beginning, it wasn't a smooth tra transition to get to, Dynam uh, to DynamoDB, but just pushing there like okay let's start with this database i don't like it but i'll start the discussions with this uh, database then we got better and better and uh, yeah now it's our favorite uh, option and now oh five minutes now Ooh, i need to be fast but this is the cool part like leave me alone <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so let's look at modeling some real applications. And uh, I have two cases that I want to show. One is full serverless, and the other one is a hybrid. And I want to talk to you why I, uh, I'm sharing both, because I can. Um, so the problem I want us to solve with, ser with the serverless approach, it's a real uh, thing that we have a trust pilot. So we have users that sign up with uh, an email. <coughs> they are created in our main uh, database as unactivated accounts, and this is stored in one of the Mongo clusters that we still have. <laughs> uh, the users will receive an email to activate their account, but if they don't activate in, the, in 30 days, then we have to go and delete the account. Uh, and I can tell you how we used to do this. Uh, we had an EC2 instance running every, I think the robot was running once per day, and then was scanning the database, the Mongo database, to see what accounts are unactive. And of course, we didn't like that approach. First of all, it wasn't serverless, and we have to go serverless. And then was also putting unnecessary load uh, on our main database so that wasn't great and this is what we came up with so again we this is event driven architecture uh, and uh, we have an api that it's sending a consumer created event now move i see people are taking pictures so probably you don't want me there um, we have an API that sends a uh, consumer created event and then another API that sends an event saying the account was activated. And those SNS events are pushed then in, uh, in a queue, a queue for unactivated and a queue for activated. And the first queue is processed by a Lambda, which will just store uh, items in the in a doc uh, in a DynamoDB, and then the other lambda for activated users it will st it will delete the items in this uh, DynamoDB. So at any given time, we have uh, only unactivated accounts in that database. And then we have um, actually can show you this. This is how it looks. Oh. That image is great. I can tell you it's uh, the way the item looks like. It's consumer ID and uh, a created at timestamp. And then we have a lambda, another lambda that will go and process. It's triggered by cron job every five minutes. Go and see what accounts are older than 30 days, and then put that in a queue, which will then be processed by another lambda that it's going to call an API to delete the accounts. 
And actually, there is another solution uh, to this when it comes to the, um, the way we process data from DynamoDB. And for instance, if instead of creating that, we store an expire at, then we can put a TTL on, the, on that data. That's also amazing uh, quality, sorry about that. Uh, but we can put a TTL and then we can use uh, the DynamoDB streams. And the streams uh, are, uh, for DynamoDB, they store any kind of activity that you do on your database. And in this case, every time when uh, an item is added, deleted, and also when an item is deleted by TTL. So we can say that with that stream, we can also trigger a lambda. Um, and in that lambda, we'll filter for the events, uh, for the activity which is specific to TTL. The drawback of this is that you'll trigger that lambda on any kind of activity. So you need to keep in mind if you have a lot of activity on that table that you don't care about, like in our case, I don't care when the item is created or deleted by those other lambdas, right? I only care about the TTL. So you, ha you have to think consideration. Is it better with the streams or is it like, can I get the job done with the cron? Uh, that will trigger the, the lambda as often as I, I want. So, but I just want to mention this other option as well because it matches on uh, what you're trying to do. And yeah, I really like the way this works because you just have, like you, you take out the load from your main database. This has its own context, it's doing the, um, its own thing and it's very nice. It, it, it's just outside of the, the main, main data. And then as I promised, uh, I'll show you a hybrid, which uh, the Amazon Aurora in this case, it's not a uh, serverless, and it's because I need to move data from our uh, data lake from S3 to Aurora, and Aurora serverless can't do that yet. Unfortunately, but I'm waiting. I'm waiting. It will be at some point the uh, serverless. But as I told you, like you have to look. Like what can you do? I I really wanted to go for serverless, but I couldn't. So I just went for a normal Aurora. And then I'm um, using DynamoDB, and as you can see, I'm pushing the the stream to a Lambda function that will then uh, save the data into an Elasticsearch service and again like you have to go for what's uh, good for your use case and in my use case i need to search the text so elastic search was built for that so i'm not going to try to reinvent that with like doing it in a dynamo db just because it's serverless like don't do that and yeah that's the point i want to make here and now let's finish up with some lessons that we learned a trust pile. I don't know if you guys learned this, but I hope you do by the end of this. So, as I mentioned many, many times already, you have to start your architecture <laughs> design with a serverless first approach. Even, even though it's not necessarily um, comfortable for you right now, just start there and slowly, slowly it will become. Like, that's what I can tell you from my experience in the beginning. I wasn't a fan. Because it's like, oh, I need to learn this now. I don't want to. I'm comfortable. What? Uh, but just start there, and slowly you'll see that you'll see all the advantages of going serverless first. Uh, then you have to consider uh, scaling and growth of your product, and choose something that can grow with you. And that's something that we've noticed at Trustpilot. We've done we've done many many times. We went with the tool. It was good for like two years, and then it's like, oh no. Now we have more data, we need to change to something else. We're refactoring, like, like we've been in, in a refactoring mode for, for years, so it's pretty annoying to, to do that. So try and look at um, where your business can go and uh, choose a, a tool that can do that. And then the last thing I want to mention is don't adopt the new technology without fully knowing how to use it. And that was our case uh, with DynamoDB. 
we didn't know how to we didn't know how to how to use this and then we blame it on on uh, AWS that oh this is crap it's not us it's definitely not us but it was us because we just didn't give ourselves time to understand how to use this thing and that's it i took longer uh, sorry <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, apparently I have time for questions as well. No. So yeah, if anyone has some questions right now, otherwise you'll find me around. It's a small place, so I can't hide. <laughs> I'll be around. Nothing. Everyone is so shy. Yeah. <gasps> Someone. Yes. Uh, yes. We did. We did uh, look a bit, uh, and it looks like um, uh, a good um, a good thing for us for the, the remaining data that we have in uh, in MongoDB. Yeah, because the so I can tell in MongoDB we have uh, the data for reviews, which is definitely a document, and we didn't find something that yeah was good for us. So that's why we we didn't move it. But now with DocumentDB, it looks. It looks promising. Uh, I think the the issue that we had was the version that uh, they could, uh, uh, yeah, transfer the data. But otherwise, it looks promising. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in, in the beginning, uh, what made you go with the AWS instead of the or GCP? Well, uh, we looked at the. Um, so before uh, Lambda functions were uh, released, we were looking at Google functions, but they weren't as good as we wanted. So when they released the Lambda function, we are like, oh, this is the right way to go. And also the, um, the way AWS works, like they always innovate, they listen to their customers. I mean, we've been complaining about things like you heard me today, um, and they react constantly to to this feedback so that was one of the, the the reason and i think when it comes to serverless they kind of win the battle uh, so yeah sorry microsoft yes i actually worked at microsoft i should say that but not anymore so <laughs> i can say these things yes in the back <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear in the beginning what is. Um, I can't really, really say because I've I've never tried it myself to try and restore. Probably the the site reliability team that we have can tell you more. Unfortunately, I don't have any, any experience with that. It just works. Yes, was someone else? No, you change your mind. Yeah, okay. I think we're good. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, a uh, big round of applause for uh, Angela once again. <laughs> <laughs>